subscribe, like, comment and share to support the channel. Thank you for the support. On a night illuminated by the full moon, the sky sparkled with countless stars, casting a magical glow over the scene. A group of brave knights stood in anticipation, their armor gleaming under the moonlight. Suddenly, a powerful voice pierced the air. The commander knight rallied his comrades, urging them to attack and defeat the figure they believed to be a demon. The so-called demon, driven by unwavering determination, swiftly charged towards the horde of knights. Closing in on the commander, who was issuing orders, the demon unleashed a mighty swing of his sword, bringing a swift end to the commander's life with a single strike. Without hesitation, the demon, now standing amidst the fallen, unleashed a potent ability, pressing his hand firmly against the ground. In an instant, a haunting purple fire engulfed all the knights present, mercilessly snuffing out their lives. Overwhelmed and exhausted, the demon sank to his knees, his breath ragged. It was then that he felt a presence drawing near. He turned his gaze to see a female knight with fiery red hair approaching him. Wearing an expression filled with pain, she confronted him, addressing him as Knox von Reinharfer, and demanded to know why he had made a pact with the devil and betrayed them. Knox, still catching his breath, looked ahead and countered her accusation. He smiled faintly and stated that from their perspective, it might seem like a betrayal. However, he asserted that it was they who had betrayed him, not the other way around. The female knight, filled with frustration, implored Knox to stop arguing and simply tell her when he had become so broken. In response, Knox began to explain that the beginning of his journey was like a crash landing. Suddenly, a notification popped up on the monitor and informed Yuchan, the player controlling Knox, that he had successfully cleared the first part of a game called Inner Lunatic, with a total clear count of 27. Yuchan expressed satisfaction with his achievements, acknowledging the acquisition of valuable items and the successful completion of hidden quests. However, behind this facade of success, a somber reality loomed, he had received the news that he would die the following month. Reflecting on the past, two years prior, Yuchan had visited multiple hospitals, seeking answers about his condition. The doctor's explanation had been unsettling, advising him not to panic and simply listen. Despite undergoing numerous tests, the results remained consistent, leaving him with little hope. The doctor had prescribed pain relief medication, suggesting he take them when the pain became unbearable. Alone in his room, Yuchan pondered the passage of time, realizing that two years had already slipped by. As he glanced at the calendar, a sudden bout of illness struck, causing him to vomit blood. Staring at the crimson stains on his hands, a profound understanding washed over him. Yuchan accepted the harsh reality that his days were numbered, acknowledging that dwelling on the inevitable wouldn't change the final outcome. Feeling isolated and devoid of social connection, Yuchan heard a series of notifications and saw that they were hospital appointment confirmations. He couldn't help but feel lonely, realizing that no one had reached out to him after his memory loss, and he had no one to reach out to in return. Additionally, his deteriorating health prevented him from venturing outside, intensifying his isolation. Glancing at the papers on his desk, he saw various documents related to late-stage cancer support groups, church flyers, and hospice options. Overwhelmed by the emotions welling up within him, Yuchan discarded the papers, and tears escaped his eyes. Turning his attention to the monitor in front of him, Yuchan noticed Inner Lunatic prompting him to start a new game. He contemplated his limited options and decided that this was all he had left. With a sense of resignation, he entered the player's name as Carl. Lost in thought, Yuchan pondered the kind of character he should create this time. He weighed the options, considering the possibilities of a mana sensitivity genius and swordsmanship and combat genius. However, a warning message appeared, cautioning him about the penalties associated with choosing multiple genius traits. It urged him to select only one or fewer genius traits to avoid those penalties. Noticing that the neutral trait was empty, Yu Chan's attention was drawn to the negative trait listed as terminally ill. He laughed, realizing that he and his character were both afflicted with this condition. Despite this revelation, 
he decided to proceed and accepted the game's prompt to start with the chosen character. Suddenly, a strange sensation overcame Yu Chan, causing him to fall from his chair. Fear gripped him as he wondered if he was truly dying at that moment. On his monitor, a message displayed that character creation was successful. He thought that if he were to die, he would at least want to die on his own terms. A notification appeared, alerting him that his character's name had been forcibly changed. Shortly after, another notification appeared, indicating a synchronization level of 4%. Then it increased to 6% and further climbed to 19%. Finally, the synchronization abruptly halted at 71%, and another notification appeared, announcing that the character's settings were completed. As he awakened, Yu Chan found himself in a state of disbelief. He surveyed his surroundings with astonishment, wondering if this place could truly be what he thought it was. In search of answers, he approached a nearby mirror, observing his reflection intently. A sense of familiarity washed over him, and he came to a startling realization that he had become the worst character known as Knox von Rainhafer in this accursed game. Knox von Rainhafer, the youngest of five siblings in the Rainhafer family, was a member of the infamous organization Lunatic. Throughout history, the Rainhafer family had produced exceptionally talented individuals skilled in magic and swordsmanship. However, Knox stood as an exception, an untalented outcast within his own family. Haunted by resentment toward a world that denied him the gifts bestowed upon his siblings, Knox made a fateful decision. He entered into a forbidden contract with the devil, ultimately transforming himself into the most despicable villain in the inner lunatic story. Gazing at his altered appearance in the mirror, Yu Chan couldn't help but question the reality before him. It felt surreal, as if he had stepped into a dream, a dream where he had become Knox. But his excitement grew as he unexpectedly encountered a stat window. He observed the information displayed within the window, revealing his basic details. His name was Knox von Rainhafer, a 14-year-old male human with darkness as his main element. However, his enthusiasm quickly diminished as he noticed his stats. With disappointment, he questioned the low value of only two points in stamina. Knox's attention then turned to his traits. He discovered a neutral trait called Void Revelation, which piqued his curiosity. However, his spirits sank as he read through his negative traits terminally ill, curse of the weak, frequent sickness, cold hands and feet, and possession. The realization that he was terminally ill in both his real life and this new world left him disheartened. The system also displayed that he had only one year of lifespan remaining. Knox reflected on his past actions, trying to make sense of why he had chosen to create a character with a terminal illness, someone who faced imminent death and had no support. Upon further contemplation, he began to understand his underlying motivation. He wanted a character that mirrored his own experiences, someone who could empathize with his struggles. Little did he know that he would eventually become that character himself. Suddenly, a notification appeared, indicating an unread mail in his mailbox. Knox's curiosity compelled him to investigate its contents. The mail began with a greeting, addressing him as Yuchan, his previous name but then it corrected itself, saying that it should call him by his new name, Knox. Knox was surprised and questioned how the system knew his name. Yuchan was a name given to him by his parents, whose whereabouts he was unaware of. Knox couldn't help but question if the entity that put him here held the key to unlocking his lost memories. The system acknowledged that Knox wouldn't remember them but conveyed the need to deliver a message. It greeted him with a nostalgic long time no see leaving Knox astounded. The system went on to acknowledge Knox's achievements over the past two years, affirming that he deserved to be where he was now. It offered a warm welcome back, leaving Knox in a state of disbelief. Knox couldn't fathom the reality unfolding before him. The notion that his old world was gone and that this new existence was now his reality seemed impossible to accept. The system responded, acknowledging its limitations in disclosing certain aspects of its identity but expressing a genuine desire to assist Knox. Knox questioned the concept of help, struggling to grasp the situation at hand. Just as he tried to comprehend it all, the system suggested that he join the Eldian Academy, 
where he could strengthen his forces and closely follow the main story, assuring that the complete truth would gradually reveal itself. As the system mail started to fade away, Knox exclaimed in surprise, wondering if that was all. Worry crept into his mind as he attempted to gather his thoughts. He realized that he had been reborn as the final boss of the game, Inner Lunatic, and now he was being asked to adhere to the main story. Inevitably, this meant that his demise awaited him. Knox's thoughts raced as he contemplated his situation. Although Inner Lunatic had become his new reality, he refused to give up on reclaiming his lost memories. He was determined to follow the main story and uncover the purpose behind his existence, all while ensuring his survival. For that purpose, he embraced his role as a true villain. Reflecting on his previous life, Knox acknowledged that not much had changed. Two years before losing his memories, he had been plagued by a terminal illness. Every moment had reminded him of his impending death, and fear had consumed him. Now, the only difference was the shift to a familiar world he knew all too well. Curiosity compelled Knox to inquire about the current date. When the system displayed February 4, 1812, urgency coursed through him. Time was not on his side, and he had to act swiftly. With determination burning within him, he resolved to embark on his 28th attempt to clear the game. As Knox reached for the doorknob, intense pain surged through his wrist bones, turning them red. To his surprise, a notification appeared, revealing the activation of a negative trait. It informed him that due to the effects of his constant sickness, he had acquired wrist inflammation level 1, urging him to rest and allow it to heal. Disbelieving, Knox muttered in astonishment, unable to comprehend the situation. Moving down the hallway, Knox clenched his hand tightly, troubled by the fragility he felt within his body. Unexpectedly, a maid collided with him, causing her to lose balance and the tray of dishes she carried to shatter on the floor. The maid looked up in surprise, her eyes widening as she recognized Knox. She whispered his name, Young Master Knox, and Knox met her gaze, feeling a flicker of recognition. Could this maid with her brown hair and light orange pupils truly be Rona? Fragmented and vague memories stirred within him, recalling Rona speaking ill of him behind his back. He wondered if this seemingly innocent girl, standing before him with tear-filled eyes, had been the one spreading rumors. Knox decided to grant her forgiveness but not without a warning. An evil grin spread across his face as he contemplated the consequences she might face for any future mistakes. Rona, with tearful eyes, understood the gravity of the situation and nodded in acknowledgement. The tranquility surrounding Knox caught his attention, and the surprised gazes of the butler and maids confirmed that his momentary madness had slipped his mind. He questioned himself, pondering the kind of life he had led thus far. Rona looked at Knox cautiously and asked where he was going so early. Knox simply replied, stating that he was heading to the practice hall. The butler and maids reacted with shock upon hearing his response, unable to comprehend his sudden decision. Knox wore a smile on his face as he added that he wanted Rona to accompany him. Fear instantly gripped Rona's thoughts as she pondered Knox's intentions. Together, Knox and Rona walked toward the practice hall. In Knox's mind, the paramount importance of survival loomed large. Having experienced the chilling embrace of death, he had become resolute in his desire to evade it. He understood that adapting quickly to his new circumstances was crucial. Deep in thought, Knox assumed a contemplative posture. He knew that despite the challenges ahead, he still held a chance. With 27 previous playthroughs, he possessed extensive knowledge of the game's hidden aspects. Inner Lunatic had gained worldwide popularity with its captivating story that pitted angels against demons and the Empire. However, what truly set Inner Lunatic apart was its extensive customization options, allowing players to adopt different playstyles. While lower ranked traits like ordinary and talented could be assigned multiple times, the highly sought after genius traits were typically limited to a single assignment. Yet, Knox possessed two genius traits, a rare occurrence in the game. By exploiting the system's attempt to analyze traits beyond the player's limits, he managed to assign two genius traits. The first was swordsmanship and combat genius, 
which granted exceptional sword skills and allowed the user to reach the pinnacle of swordsmanship. The second trait, Mana Sensitivity Genius, heightened the user's sensitivity to magic, enabling more efficient spellcasting. Knox contemplated the vast array of other useful traits at his disposal. Insight, as a main character perk, bestowed the ability to view the status window of other characters, providing valuable information. Additionally, Master of Acting allowed the user to effortlessly adapt to any situation, proving particularly advantageous in his current circumstances. Furthermore, Steel Mentality, when utilized during battle, enabled the user to maintain mental fortitude, keeping a cool and composed demeanor. Knox assessed his negative traits, acknowledging the significant challenges they posed. Among them, the terminally ill stood out the most. The other negative traits he possessed were the curse of the weak, frequent sickness, cold hands and feet, and possession. Those afflicted with cold hands and feet found it nearly impossible to enter icy areas without a warming skill. With frequent sickness, Knox anticipated fainting at least once every chapter due to its effects. Contemplating his situation, Knox realized he had no other choice but to proceed step by step, accepting the challenges that lay ahead. Observing Knox standing still, Rona, with a hint of disbelief, wondered if he truly intended to enter the practice hall. Moments later, her surprise grew as she witnessed Knox walking toward the gate. Knox pushed open the gate, determined to confront the first obstacle, the curse of the weak. This curse afflicted users from birth, reducing their growth rate by half and making them twice as susceptible to enemy debuffs. As Knox continued his sword practice, a profound sense of despair washed over him. No matter how much he pondered the situation, he could only reach one conclusion, he was doomed. Exhausted and lying on the ground, Knox struggled to catch his breath. The realization that he couldn't swing the sword more than ten times struck him deeply. He lamented the immense difficulty imposed by the curse of the weak. Looking around, Knox found solace in the abundance of weapons available. This wealth of weaponry was a testament to the Rainhafer family's origins, centered around the sword. Known as the High House of the Blade in Darkness, the Rainhafer family had earned this title through their mastery of imbuing a tribute magic into their dark blades. With great proficiency, they could slash through their enemies. All of this was made possible by the legendary Commander's Blade, also known as the Tyrannical Blade of Darkness. This ancestral sword had been passed down through generations carrying on the tradition and legacy of the Rainhafer family. Knox contemplated the advantages of being part of a noble family, setting aside his prowess in swordsmanship. One of the greatest benefits was the abundance of wealth. With a delighted expression, he admired the Rainhafer family's substantial fortune. As one of the prominent noble families in the story, their wealth was so significant that even their seemingly useless young son, Knox, had enough money to sustain a life without ever having to work. Knox believed that his father, Teo, likely didn't concern himself with how wisely Knox managed his finances. After all, Knox didn't possess that kind of character. As the youngest son of a noble family, his character archetype was clear. With his legs trembling, Knox managed to stand up. He remembered Rona's fearful behavior and her plea not to involve her in anything strange. A few minutes earlier, Rona had brought a wooden sword and a towel, informing Knox that they were ready for him. However, she couldn't help but wonder if he truly intended to engage in exercise. Knox realized that there was no one around and motioned for Rona to come closer. Rona displayed a frightened demeanor, questioning his intentions and expressing concern that he might hit her. Knox, caught up in his frustration, exclaimed and asked her what she was talking about. He then grasped Rona's ear, pulling her closer, and whispered something in her ear. After hearing Knox, Rona shouted in surprise, questioning his plans. She looked at him, expressing her disbelief that his ideas were merely garbage. However, Knox commanded her to figure it out and sharply told her to be quiet. Rona replied with a trembling voice, acknowledging his request. As Rona left to retrieve the requested items, she couldn't help but think to herself that the young master hadn't changed a bit. Meanwhile, Knox contemplated the time it would take for Rona to complete her task, hoping that everything would be ready by tomorrow. He poured himself some tea, 
pondering a solution to his curse and the need to increase his stamina. Suddenly, a voice interrupted his thoughts. It was Rodwell D. Ernark, the head butler. Knox was taken aback as he recognized Rodwell, who held a significant position as one of the main managers of the Rainhafer estate. Rodwell served as an advisor to Knox's father, Theo von Rainhafer, who was also the family head. Knox realized that dealing with Rodwell wouldn't be as straightforward as with others since he held a position of authority within the family. Knox pondered the encounter, considering it a potentially significant challenge. He wondered if Rodwell had noticed something unusual happening and contemplated his own means of handling the situation. Knox activated his positive trait of master of acting and questioned Rodwell's presence, stating that the head butler should be serving the family head. Head butler Rodwell informed Knox that he had received orders to share some news with him. Knox curiously inquired about the nature of the news. The head butler revealed that Knox was instructed to participate in tonight's dinner. Knox, unfamiliar with the family in the situation, hesitated at the idea of having dinner with the family head. He contemplated the request, realizing his lack of knowledge about the family dynamics. Knox responded to the head butler, expressing his reluctance to attend the dinner. Head butler internally pondered the master's intentions behind ordering young master Knox to participate in the dinner. Head butler then reported that the lady of the still and her family had arrived and was seeking night training. He emphasized that if Knox refused to participate, it would likely anger the family head. Knox let out a sigh, acknowledging the circumstances. He understood the importance of following his father's orders and reluctantly agreed to attend the dinner. Head butler observed Knox with a questioning gaze and thought aloud that something was off about him that day. Knox, somewhat defensive, asked if there was something the head butler wanted to say. The head butler acknowledged Knox's unusual behavior, noting that Knox had never shown much interest in wielding a blade before. He inquired about the reason behind Knox's decision to visit the practice hall on his own. Knox, with a stern expression, firmly asserted his independence and authority, warning the head butler not to overstep his boundaries as a mere butler. He made it clear that his actions and intentions were his own to decide. Taken aback, the head butler apologized, recognizing that he had crossed a line. As Knox walked away, the head butler's gaze was filled with questioning thoughts, realizing the need to report this encounter to the family head. Inside his room, Knox closed the door and took a moment to catch his breath. He reflected on the unexpected confrontation, feeling relieved that possession didn't activate. Knox shifted his focus to the mention of the young lady from the still and her family, wondering why she was present in their household. During the dinner, Knox found himself being mocked by twin brothers Hartz and Alan. Alan expressed surprise and disbelief that Knox had shown up, indicating that he wouldn't enjoy the meal because of it. Hartz questioned whether Knox still had regrets about being part of the family, to which Alan agreed. Alan directly addressed Knox, expressing his disbelief at seeing him there and accusing him of inappropriate behavior with one of the maids. Hartz joined in, stating that Knox was a lost cause. Despite the mocking, Knox remained calm, recognizing that he hadn't done anything to warrant such treatment. At that moment, Theo von Rainhafer, the family head of the Rainhafer family and Knox's father, entered the scene. Knox acknowledged his presence, aware of his role within the family. Following Teo's arrival, a beautiful girl with red hair introduced herself as Talia von Stillener. The family head mentioned that Talia had requested night practice and would be spending time at their estate, urging everyone to greet her warmly. Knox gazed at Talia and contemplated her significance. In the game Inner Lunatic, she was the hero and the character who opposed the future villain, Knox. Knox recognized that in the near future, it would be Talia who would eventually stab him in the chest with a sword. Family head Teo acknowledged Knox's presence at the dinner and suggested that since everyone was gathered, they should proceed with the meal. During the dinner, Knox observed Hartz and Alan engaged in a discussion. Hartz proposed to their father, Teo, that it was time to decide the next person to enter Eldian Academy. Teo considered the suggestion and agreed that it was indeed the appropriate time to make that decision. 
Albion Academy held great importance within the game Inner Lunatic, serving as the place where pupils faced various challenges and fought demons, forming the main storyline. Knox realized that attending the academy was crucial for him. It would allow him to gather his own allies while following the overall structure of the story. However, family head Teo clarified that Eldian Academy only permitted three individuals from each family to attend. This limitation aimed to restrict the influence of the nobles. Teo mentioned that he had already used two slots for his first and second sons, leaving the Rainhafer family with just one more entrance ticket available for the academy. Knox listened to the family head's announcement and contemplated the importance of obtaining the remaining entrance ticket to Eldian Academy. He understood that he needed to do whatever it took to secure that ticket before he could focus on forming alliances. Knox spoke up and concluded that the family head was proposing a fight between the brothers. This took the family head by surprise, as he hadn't expected Knox to be the first to react. Confirming Knox's assumption, the family head declared that a duel would take place in the practice hall one month from now to determine the next attendee. The duel would follow their family traditions for such decisions. Hartz took the opportunity to mock Knox, urging him to stay quiet to avoid embarrassing himself. Alan joined in, belittling Knox and stating that someone like him, who had never wielded a sword, stood no chance against them. Knox calmly took a sip of his wine and responded to Alan's taunts, stating that they could discuss it after he emerged victorious. Alan expressed disbelief in Knox's abilities, but Knox remained focused. He understood that the upcoming duel was another trial he needed to face in order to secure the entrance ticket. He refused to be swayed by the taunts and insults directed at him. Confident in his own abilities, Knox looked ahead and boldly declared that he would be the one to attend Eldian Academy. This surprised the family head and further infuriated Hearts and Alan. Talia, the young lady from the still in her family, chuckled at Knox's declaration and commented on his confidence. Knox glanced at her but internally felt a sense of unease, realizing that he might have drawn the attention of someone he shouldn't have. Inside the family head's office, Teo acknowledged that something had indeed changed about Knox, as reported by the head butler. Teo pondered the cause of this change, wondering if Knox had been possessed by a demon. Regardless, he acknowledged that Knox had captured his attention. Teo instructed the head butler, Rodwell, to continue keeping a close eye on Knox. The family head was curious about the transformation in Knox and wanted to understand the reasons behind it. Meanwhile, Knox was running at the practice hall, sweating and panting heavily. Observing the scene, one of the maids commented on his frequent visits to the practice hall. Another maid mentioned the upcoming duel in one month, sparking curiosity among them about Knox's sudden dedication to physical training. Knox overheard their conversation, wondering why he was able to pick out their words so clearly and questioning if he had a special trait. At that moment, he received a system message indicating a slight increase in his stamina stat. Knox expressed disappointment at the small increment and reflected on the significance of stamina for him. He recognized that his low stamina was his greatest obstacle and a hindrance to unlocking his full potential with the trait swordsmanship and combat genius. Knox understood that the requirement to utilize the trait was to have his stamina stat reach for. However, Due to the curse of the week, it had taken him a month to increase his stamina by only 1.9 points. Knox felt frustrated with the curse of the week, a trait that reduced his growth rate by half. Despite putting in a lot of effort, he had only managed to increase his stamina by a small amount, and the terminal illness trait further hindered his progress. Knox realized that he needed to exert four times as much effort compared to others just to see minimal improvements. The difficulty of his situation weighed heavily on him. However, Knox decided to set aside those concerns for the time being. Just then, Roan arrived, pushing a moving tray filled with the materials Knox had requested the previous day. Knox acknowledged her arrival, realizing that she was faster than he had anticipated. With the supplies now available, he felt confident about making progress. Contemplating how to reach a stamina level of 4, Knox reassured himself that there were no issues. He believed that his knowledge would allow him to overcome any obstacles. Curious about the purpose of the materials, Rona questioned why Knox needed them, 
expressing concern about their dangerous nature and their expensive cost. She pointed out that the scroll seemed to be the only useful item among them. Knox simply replied that people didn't know how to use those materials effectively, implying that their usefulness was hidden from others. As Rona looked at him with a questioning expression, Knox picked up a bottle of elixir and drank it in one go. Panicking, Rona shouted that it was poison. Sweat covered Knox's face as he acknowledged the potency of the poison. A system notification appeared, indicating that Knox had consumed the poison of the three-headed gorgon and his health would temporarily increase by 1.5 times. It also informed him that his death counter had started, with 9 minutes and 59 seconds remaining until death. As Rona grew increasingly panicked, she exclaimed that she would call the head butler for assistance. However, Knox urged her to wait and proceeded to eat the core, ignoring her pleas. Rona's worry intensified as she exclaimed that the core was not meant for consumption. A system notification appeared, indicating that Knox had consumed the core of the golem and would slowly be petrified as a result. Another notification followed, stating that a hidden piece had been activated and that the poison of the three-headed gorgon was reacting with the golem's core. Knox was pleased with the results and thought that his plan was working perfectly. The golem's core was originally used to petrify people or increase their defense quickly, or to create artificial golems. However, when combined with the three-headed gorgon poison, it had a special effect. Notifications continued to appear, indicating that a special effect had been activated and the poison of the three-headed gorgon had been diluted, causing the negative trait curse of the weak to disappear. Knox was ecstatic, as the curse that had plagued him was now gone. However, Rona, with tears in her eyes, looked at Knox and expressed her concern, fearing that he might soon die. Ignoring her worries, Knox suddenly began to unbutton his shirt, causing Rona to cover her eyes in embarrassment and exclaim in shock. After unbuttoning his shirt further, Knox poured an elixir bottle onto his head, prompting a series of notifications to appear. The dew of the remembering fairy countered the petrification effects of the golem's core, and a hidden piece was activated. Knox felt a surge of satisfaction as his plan unfolded precisely as intended. The notification informed him that the blessing of growth, a temporary trait, was granted through the interaction of the dew and the golem's core. This blessing would double his stat growth until his stamina reached five. Left with only the scroll, Knox picked it up and activated the Rapid Stamina Growth Scroll with another notification confirming his action. This scroll would double his stamina growth rate. As Knox contemplated the results, he realized that he had successfully eliminated the curse and with the blessing of growth mitigating the debuffs from the terminally ill trait, coupled with the effects of the scroll, his current growth rate should be twice that of most people. This meant he should be able to increase his stamina stat at a much faster pace. Suddenly, Rona leaped onto Knox, causing him to momentarily lose his balance. Concern filled her teary eyes as she questioned his well-being. Knox, slightly annoyed at her interruption, initially demanded a towel but softened when he saw her distress. With a reassuring smile, he assured Rona that he was fine. She continued to worry suggesting he should rest and consider calling the head butler for assistance. Knox, once again, reassured her, insisting that he was all right. Curious about his next course of action, Rona inquired about his plans. Knox simply replied with a single word, run. In that moment, Knox and Rona sprinted through the practice hall, their actions capturing the attention of Talia, who stood nearby, observing them. Talia who had been closely observing Knox, couldn't comprehend why someone as seemingly weak as him would accept a match against his brothers. Her maid, Emma, tried to caution Talia against staring at Knox and reminded her of proper etiquette. However, Talia interrupted Emma, expressing her frustration and disbelief at Knox's lack of sword skills and refusal to accept help from the other knights of Rainhafer. Talia couldn't shake off her annoyance though she couldn't fully understand why she was so bothered by Knox's situation when she believed he would simply end up getting beaten up within a month. Despite her thoughts, Talia's annoyance persisted. Determined to address the matter, Talia walked towards the practice hall, informing her maid, Emma, that she would be right back. Approaching Knox as he rested, 
Talia introduced herself, stating her name. Knox was taken by surprise at her approach and wondered why she had sought him out. He asked her what she wanted, noting that he had heard her name before. Talia, feeling somewhat flustered by Knox's cold attitude, thought to herself that he must have been taken aback by her beauty. She confronted Knox, questioning his confidence in being able to defeat his brothers and asked if that was the reason why he had accepted the match. She further inquired whether he truly believed that he could defeat his brother by simply running away like this. Talia went on to offer her assistance, expressing her willingness to help him. However, Knox calmly rejected her offer, telling her to get lost and showing no interest in her help. Talia was taken aback by Knox's response and exclaimed in disbelief, expressing her indignation at being treated this way when she was offering her support. On the sidelines, Rona observed the exchange and thought that if Knox continued to speak in such a manner, it would make girls dislike him. Unwilling to persuade Knox any further, Talia turned to walk away from the practice hall, clearly upset with his refusal and dismissive attitude. Knox, using his insight ability on Talia, gained access to her stat window, allowing him to learn more about her abilities and traits. He observed that Talia possessed impressive stats particularly in terms of stamina, which surpassed that of most grown males. While her potential may not match that of the three sword masters or the four great mages on the continent, Knox recognized that she had the potential to reach their level and effectively combat demons with her fire attribute magic. Knox also knew that in the near future, Talia's fire attribute magic would awaken to white flames and be used to burn the demonized version of himself. Understanding the significance of making Talia his ally at this point, as it would drastically alter the future events of the story, Knox pondered how to navigate the original story while avoiding his own demise. He questioned whether it was possible to maintain a good relationship with someone who would eventually be responsible for his death. One month later, Talia walked through the hallway, reflecting on the praise she had received for her quick learning abilities and the expectations tied to the Stillrainer family's talent. However, she couldn't help but feel inferior compared to her sister's exceptional talent. Talia questioned her own potential and wondered if she could ever become a knight. Reminding herself of the qualities and principles a knight must possess, she contemplated the path she needed to follow. Knights should never be consumed by greed, maintain a frugal lifestyle, and be willing to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. In addition, they must master the art of swordsmanship and adhere to proper form to become true knights. Talia pondered the possibility of Knox being able to defeat his brothers, who had trained for years, solely by focusing on cardio exercises. She expressed her doubt, believing it to be unlikely for him to succeed. The next day arrived, and Knox and Alan stood in the center of the ring, surrounded by a crowd of spectators eagerly awaiting the official duel that would determine who would earn the right to enter Eldian Academy. Thysila, the first wife of the family head, was also present at the scene. Meanwhile, the head butler, standing nearby, overheard the family head calling out to him. The family head inquired about the butler's thoughts on the outcome of the duel. After considering young Master Allen's past performances, the head butler stated that it was highly likely that Alan would emerge victorious. The family head agreed, assuming the same outcome. However, the head butler couldn't help but wonder if the family head had different expectations. Having once walked the path of a knight alongside the family head, the butler understood that the art of the blade could be intricate or straightforward. The level of skill and dedication determine one's proficiency. There was only one way to surpass someone previously ahead and force them to kneel, the insurmountable wall of overwhelming talent. The butler pondered whether young Master Knox possessed such innate talent. Interrupting the butler's thoughts, the family head spoke, acknowledging that the possibility might not be zero and that the youngest, born with Rainhafer blood, might possess the talent of a sword emperor. As Knox stood in the dual grounds, he received a notification indicating that his trait, swordsmanship and combat genius, was inactive. Frustration washed over him as he contemplated his seemingly unlucky streak and questioned whether his luck stat was actually negative. Despite his efforts, he couldn't reach a stamina stat of four. A few days earlier, while Knox was running, 
he received multiple notifications activating his trade effects and gradually increasing his stamina stat by 0.1. Now his stamina had reached 3.8. Rona, who ran alongside him, expressed her exhaustion and questioned whether she had to continue running with him. Knox, wiping sweat from his face, replied that it wouldn't be fun without her and jokingly mentioned who would take care of him if she didn't. Rona, with teary eyes, suspected that she heard him say something else. Knox then handed her a towel and assigned her another task, to which Rona responded with a pouting face. Playfully, Knox accused Rona of cursing him in her mind, but she denied it and accidentally bit her tongue in the process. Knox chuckled at the thought of Rona having good stamina and contemplated using his insight ability to view her stats. To his surprise, Rona's stamina stat was 4.5 surpassing his own despite his dedicated training. Knox was astonished by the strength of the Rainhafer family, where even a maid was stronger than an average man. Rona reminded Knox that it was already evening and suggested he rest before the duel. Knox, panting heavily, felt the pressure of time and thought that he didn't have enough time to increase his stamina. Back at the duel ring, Alan addressed Knox and proposed that he should give up. Despite Knox being considered the shame of their family, Alan expressed hesitation in beating him too severely. Knox responded, stating that Alan didn't seem to want him to give up. Alan shifted his attention to Talia, the daughter of the Stillrainer family, and expressed his desire to impress her. He believed that Knox would assist him in achieving that goal. However, Knox expressed uncertainty about whether it was a wise decision. Observing Alan's stamina stat of eight, Knox realized that he couldn't defeat him using ordinary methods and contemplated alternative approaches. As the referee announced the duel between Knox and Allen for the admission ticket to Eldian Academy, he emphasized that both of them must accept whatever the results may be and that objections would not be tolerated. Knox felt nervous, realizing that everything hinged on this duel. His main objective was to find his memories and discover the sender of the letter, as he knew that after the one year grace period, his life would be in danger. The referee asked one last time if both of them were ready, and then he announced the beginning of the duel. Alan initiated the attack with a swift sword strike, aiming to strike Knox, but with agile dexterity, Knox evaded the blow by gracefully sidestepping. Reacting swiftly, Alan followed up with a forceful kick, intending to overpower Knox. However, Knox skillfully blocked the kick with his sword, although the impact still pushed him backward. Impressed by Knox's deft defense, Alan acknowledged his opponent's skill, and the duel pressed on, with Alan relentless in his assault, leaving Knox on the defensive. Amidst the intense clash, Knox recognized the consistent rule of the damned inner lunatic game, surrendering everything upon defeat, but regaining control over his destiny upon victory. Suddenly, a notification appeared, indicating an incremental increase of 0.1 in Knox's stamina stat. A smile adorned Knox's face as he witnessed this development, realizing that triumph in the duel held the potential to grant him all he desired. Observing Knox's smile, Alan jokingly questioned if he had struck Knox's head one too many times, determined to continue his relentless attacks in hopes of pacifying his opponent. Meanwhile, Fissila, Alan's mother, attentively observed the fight, confident that her son would be the final child of the family to gain entry into Eldian Academy. In the midst of the duel, Alan launched a ferocious attack, nearly causing Knox to lose his balance. It was at that moment that Fissila overheard a disapproving comment, diverting her attention to its source, the family head. His countenance betrayed disappointment, as he had eagerly anticipated witnessing Knox's transformation, only to find his current performance underwhelming. Inwardly, Fissila harbored aspirations for the day when the true extent of her power would be revealed to the family. Expressing his disappointment, the family head voiced his expectations, comparing the talents of Alan and Hearts to his firstborn son, Garen, finding them lacking. Memories of his past prowess, dominating opponents with overwhelming power while wielding the dark sword of domination, filled his mind. Contemplating who would ultimately inherit that formidable weapon, the family head resolved to bring an end to the duel, rising from his seat with determination. On the duel ring, Knox received a message notifying him of an incremental increase of 0.1 in his stamina, 
swiftly followed by the activation of his innate trait, swordsmanship and combat genius. Overwhelmed with excitement, Knox burst into laughter, catching both Alan and the family head off guard. Knox then employed a skill, triggering a system message that confirmed the activation of the skill Hour of the Genius. Knox's thoughts raced as he recollected a saying that distinguished geniuses and the talented, each having their own unique time. In that moment, he believed that it was his time, a moment of genius. With the skill now active, Knox perceived the world around him decelerating, as if time itself had slowed. This bestowed upon him a distinct advantage in the duel, while his adversary's movements appeared sluggish, his own actions quickened, enabling him to react swiftly and execute precise maneuvers. Fully utilizing this skill proved challenging, but with his innate trait, swordsmanship and combat genius, now activated, Knox wielded the skill with finesse. Seizing the opportunity, Knox unleashed a formidable assault against Allen, his strike powerful and unyielding. The force of the blow caused Allen's sword to be dislodged from his grip, leaving him defenseless. With victory within sight, Knox's determination intensified, firmly believing that he would emerge triumphant in the duel. As Allen's grip faltered, frustration burned in his eyes, directed at Knox. Knox, wearing a smug expression, met Allen's gaze with amusement, stating that the duel had been an enjoyable experience. Overwhelmed by his own vexation, Allen could only manage a bewildered exclamation. Knox's thoughts raced as he realized he couldn't afford to let his guard down. The skill he utilized had a limited duration of five minutes, urging him to conclude the battle within that time frame, regardless of the circumstances. Knox's face lit up with confidence as he addressed Allen and Hartz, revealing that he had been holding back until now, finding their performance lackluster. He suggested a swift resolution, urging them to attack him simultaneously. The unexpected request from Knox left Allen and Hartz in a state of shock, their minds struggling to comprehend the situation. Knox then turned to the family head, seeking permission for a two-on-one -on -one battle against his brothers. The family head's expression reflected a mix of curiosity and doubt as he assessed Knox's demeanor. Meanwhile, Talia's voice trembled with concern as she whispered, questioning Knox's current actions and unable to fathom his motives. Observing Knox's newfound energy and determination, the family head sensed that something had changed about him. Intrigued, he decided to grant Knox's request, allowing this unconventional sparring scenario. Just then, Fissila rose from her seat, prepared to intervene, but her plea went unnoticed by the family head, who remained resolute in his decision. With a simple command, he signaled the commencement of the battle, setting the stage for what was to come. Alan retrieved his fallen sword from the ground, his movements driven by determination. Hearts, seething with annoyance and resentment toward Knox for humiliating them in front of their father, radiated anger. Knox stood before them, maintaining a serene smile, ready to confront them head-on. Hearts issued a warning, indicating that Knox should brace himself for what awaited him. Without further delay, both Alan and Hearts launched their assault on Knox simultaneously, their swords colliding with a resounding clash. The air crackled with intensity as the battle unfolded. Amidst the clash of steel, Alan, in a desperate attempt to strategize, gestured to Hearts, signaling for him to close in on Knox's left side. However, Hearts expressed his frustration and abruptly told Alan to keep quiet. Knox showcased remarkable skill deftly defending against their relentless attacks, blocking and parrying with precision. In that moment, a message appeared before Knox, notifying him that the hour of the genius had granted its special effect, enhancing his proficiency in the Dark Family's low-grade swordsmanship. A smile crept onto Knox's face as he recognized the newfound clarity in his swordsmanship. Seizing the opportune moment, Knox swiftly retaliated, countering their attack and landing a calculated strike on Alan's shoulder. Both Alan and Hearts, visibly exhausted, panted heavily, struggling to catch their breath. In contrast, Knox stood composed, seemingly unfazed by the physical toll of the battle. He observed their perplexed expressions, aware that they must be questioning how he had transformed from a symbol of family humiliation into this formidable adversary. 
their silent exchange was interrupted by Knox's voice, reminding Alan and Hartz not to lose focus during their spar. Fueled by determination, Knox pressed on with his assault, finding joy in the act of wielding the sword itself, a smile spreading across his face. Knox's swift sword swing captured the attention of Talia, the family head, and others present, eliciting surprise from their wide-eyed expressions. Hearts, who bore the brunt of the attack, struggled to process the impossible feat unfolding before him. Despite his attempts to block, Hearts fell to the ground, defeated. Alan and Hearts, both on their knees, expressed their frustration through gritted teeth. A message appeared before Knox, indicating the end of the hour of the genius skill. Knox stood victorious but breathed heavily, his fatigued form revealing the weight of the battle. Seeing her sons defeated, Fissila shouted out in concern for Alan and Hearts, her worry evident in her voice. Knox turned his gaze toward the referee and silently inquired if the victor had been decided. The referee responded with an affirmative nod confirming Knox von Reinhafer as the triumphant combatant. With a formal announcement, the referee declared Knox's victory to the gathered audience. Consumed by anger, Alan clenched his fists in frustration, unable to accept the defeat. Knox released his grip on the sword and shifted his focus to the family head, who wore a content smile on his face. Expressing his gratitude, Knox respectfully bowed to the family head before announcing his departure. As Knox made his way toward the exit, Talia locked her gaze on him, her face displaying a determined expression. Realizing the urgency of the situation, she felt compelled to reach out to Knox without delay, her mind set on the necessity of an immediate conversation. Just as Knox stepped outside, a sudden bout of coughing overcame him. Glancing down at his hands, he discovered them stained with blood. Realization dawned upon him as he recognized that he had used the skill for a little too long. Knox was well aware of the significant flaw within the skill hour of the genius. Exceeding its allotted duration triggered a debuff called recoil, which took a toll on him. Just then, a message materialized, confirming the repercussions of the skill's recoil. It revealed that his life had been diminished by a duration of two days and seventeen hours. Knox comprehended the gravity of this debuff, understanding that it permanently reduced his lifespan and made him more vulnerable to illnesses. Taking a moment to collect his thoughts, Knox let out a relieved sigh, grateful that the recoil hadn't manifested in front of others. He acknowledged that if his condition had been exposed, his admission to the academy might have been jeopardized. However, his respite was short-lived as his attention was drawn to a voice calling out to him. Knox turned toward the source of the sound and found Talia standing there. Her inquiry pierced through the air as she asked if he had sustained any injuries during the spar. Knox's mind raced with worry as he realized Talia had discovered his condition. It troubled him deeply that she was the one who found out, and he couldn't let Theo uncover the truth about his ability's rebound. He pondered anxiously, searching for a way to handle the situation. Before Knox could utter a word, Talia interrupted him, expressing surprise at his victory in a sibling fight despite his frailty. Knox was taken aback and questioned her statement. In response, Talia blushed and confessed her misunderstanding. For the past month, she had seen Knox clumsily swinging a wooden sword, never witnessing him wield a real one. Assuming his triumph came from innate talent, she decided to inquire about his awakening and training of such skill. However, as the duels concluded, Talia noticed a change in Knox's demeanor when he was alone. Confused and concerned, she questioned herself about the true nature of his abilities in his current state. Inwardly, Talia came to a realization. She understood that Knox wasn't the worthless person rumors depicted him as. Instead, he had dedicated himself to hard work and training, going to great lengths to secure victory. Witnessing Knox coughing, worry enveloped Talia, and she reached out her hand to check on him. Knox swatted her hand away, stating his aversion to being touched. Internally, he felt embarrassed, realizing that his two years of gaming obsession had hindered his social skills. Furthermore, knowing Talia was a character who could kill him made it even more challenging to interact with her. Talia wore a sorrowful expression and apologized to Knox. Perplexed, he questioned the reason behind her apology. 
Tali explained that she hadn't realized how serious Knox was about the sword, believing he solely focused on stamina training due to his weak body since birth. She expressed regret for misjudging him and acknowledged that his portrayal as a worthless person might not have been his intention. She mentioned that Emma had taught her that people can make mistakes in their perceptions. Knox contemplated how to respond to Talia's genuine honesty. He recognized her sincerity, reflecting the qualities he had observed in her character within the game. Despite her knightly qualities, being the daughter of a proud and esteemed Duke family made it challenging for her to admit when she was wrong. Finally, Knox spoke, urging Talia not to disclose his bleeding condition to others if she held such a view of him. Talia confidently assured him that she would keep his secret. Knox observed her response and thought that maybe he didn't need to worry about others discovering his situation. Turning away, Knox walked off, instructing Talia to keep her promise. As Talia watched Knox's departing figure, her face flushed red with a mix of emotions. In family head Teo's office, the family head expressed his satisfaction with his earlier conjecture. He turned to the head butler and inquired about his opinion on Knox's talent. The head butler shared his views, initially struggling to understand why Knox allowed himself to be beaten. However, after observing other children of his age and young masters, the head butler concluded that Knox was the most exceptional among them. The family head agreed with the head butler's assessment and expressed suspicion that Knox might possess additional hidden talents. He directed the head butler to closely monitor all of Knox's actions emphasizing the importance of their sole task, observing Knox, regardless of his activities. The head butler acknowledged the order, pledging to fulfill his duties diligently. Inside Knox's residence, he received a message indicating the completion of the tutorial quest and his victory in the first fight. Knox realized that this world had become a reality while retaining game-like elements. Another message appeared, announcing rewards for his achievements, including three free stat points. Knox was pleasantly surprised and exclaimed that he had hit the jackpot. However, his excitement waned quickly when he realized that despite a whole month of rigorous running, his stamina had only increased by two points. He expressed disappointment, suggesting they should have granted him these rewards much earlier. But the stat he needed to invest these points in wasn't stamina, it was luck. Knox opened his status window and allocated all three points into the luck stat, raising it from 7 to 10. He reasoned that luck was valuable, especially in the inner lunatic game, as it was a stat that couldn't be easily increased through hard work. Knox, eager to test the value of his increased luck stat, received additional messages regarding benefits, including mass clear rewards, a random gotcha voucher, and a one-time use skill confirmation voucher. Knox felt relieved that the benefit system was still in place, appreciating the opportunities it provided. Knox eagerly decided to use the gotcha right away, and a gotcha machine materialized before him. Seeing it in person felt alien to him. Knox rotated the handle, hoping for a high-ranking reward. He remembered that with his high luck stat, there was a 95% chance of getting an intermediate rank or above. Knowing that basic ranks and those below were white, Intermediate ranks were silver, and advanced ranks would be gold, with Rainbow being the highest rank, Knox yearned for at least a gold or higher rank reward. His excitement grew as his reward materialized, and he joyfully exclaimed. Upon opening the scroll, new messages appeared, identifying the rank and revealing that he had obtained an advanced trait called Supreme Ruler's Awe. Knox couldn't believe his luck and expressed happiness at acquiring such a powerful trait. The skill information revealed that it was an active skill of advanced rank with no attribute. Its effect was that those with a lower status value than him would have all their stats reduced by 20%. Considering it a jackpot, Knox smiled at the fact that it was a debuff skill. However, he knew another reward awaited him. Knox then received the message asking if he would like to use the one-time use skill confirmation voucher. He knew the skill he would obtain from this voucher was already predetermined and one of the hidden pieces he needed to achieve his goal. He decided to save it for when Theo gathered all the siblings in the estate. Knox realized that it was almost time for Grain von Rainhafer, the second son of the Rainhafer family, to return to the estate after completing his night training. 
Knox acknowledged that he had to find the hidden piece and handle grain, leaving no time for rest. However, he felt relieved that he probably didn't need to worry about Talia anymore, considering her character and the promise she made. He believed there was no reason for her to approach him again. To his surprise, the very next day, he found Talia standing in front of him. Knox questioned why she was there after they had settled everything the day before. Talia, looking down, spoke in a low voice, but Knox couldn't understand her, so he asked her to clarify. Talia then looked up at Knox with a confident expression and asked him how he had become so strong so quickly and how she could become stronger too. Knox remained silent at the question that Talia had asked him, he decides to walk past her, saying that she had secretly watched him train for a month which caused disbelief in Talia. She blushes at the word secretly, she yells out to Knox to wait for her and to at least spar with her or tell her how he trained as he walked away, Knox tried to remember what Talia's reason was, recalling that she was a character who wanted to be recognized by her sister, he then turns to her, telling her that before asking him about things such as training or sparing, she should think of her talent first as he stares at her, Talia remained speechless as she gazed at Knox for the words he had just said. Knox thought to himself that he had never comforted anyone before and wondered what to say, he turns around once more to tell Talia not to compare herself to others, before making his exit, Talia with her mouth still open, closes it as she blushes at the words Knox had said to her making her think deeply as he just left her there. As he continued on his path, Knox felt a flicker of relief, hoping that Talia would no longer be a distraction on his journey. Arriving at a familiar gathering place, Knox found his two brothers and their father, the esteemed family head, awaiting him. It was the Reinharfer family's renowned barn, where the finest horses in the entire continent were raised. The purpose of their gathering was soon revealed, each sibling would choose a horse, a lifelong companion. Knox's heart raced with anticipation. He understood the significance of this moment, knowing that horses were considered sacred creatures within the family and the world they inhabited. Whether one chose the path of a mage or a knight, selecting a horse was an essential step. Interrupting his thoughts, the family head announced that Knox, as the victor of the duel, would have the first choice. The weight of that responsibility settled upon Knox, as he knew he had to choose wisely. Entering the barn, Knox's eyes skimmed the assortment of horses before him. Adorable creatures stood before him, but he remained focused on finding the one he sought and there it was, a seemingly diminutive and feeble horse, hidden amidst the others. Knox's determination never wavered as he approached the horse. He turns to his family, announcing that he had chosen the weakest and smallest horse in the barn. He could feel the surprise radiating from his brothers and even from the family head, who wore a perplexed expression. The horse he had chosen defied expectations, but Knox had his reasons. The family head tells Knox that he was given another chance to choose a different horse, this tells Knox that the horse he chose was a really bad choice, but through his insight ability, Knox triggered the loading of the horse's stat window. What appeared before him was astounding, a high-ranked obsidian horse, with darkness as its main element. Knox understood the rarity and potential within this creature as summon creatures are divided into ranks, depending on its growth, it can grow more than one rank. Knox smiles to himself, aware that the horse he chose can obtain the highest rank. Its obsidian trait makes it the most rare kind of many out there, and refers to the type of igneous rock. He turns to glance at the family head, thinking that if he knew the horse's traits, he would have taken the horse himself. He further thought, despite the horse's current state, marked by multiple debuffs and a looming sense of mortality, Knox held firm in his decision. He believed that with his knowledge and abilities, he could save this remarkable horse. The family head, concerned and disappointed, questioned Knox's choice, doubting his reasoning. He wondered if Knox had projected himself onto the horse, thinking that Knox was just an emotional and weak one, making him a disappointment. The family head tells Knox that he hopes he would not regret his decision. The family head turns to leave, as the brothers called out to him. Knox wondered if his decision was really that disappointment as the others selected their own horses. The head butler interjected, urging Knox to name the horse. He pondered for a moment about the name, when it quickly dawned on him, he settled on the name Carl. It was a name that held profound significance for him, 
as it was the name he used to clear the game inner lunatic. Later, in the privacy of his room, Knox observed Carl lying on the bed, covered by a protective sheet. Knox had taken the precaution of hiding the horse from prying eyes, ensuring that his actions remained hidden. Knox's gaze met Carl's determined eyes, mirroring his own struggle for survival. He recognized that Carl, like himself, fought against the impending end, clinging to the desire for more time. Summoning Rona, Knox demanded her immediate response, only to witness her stumble and fall upon entering. Teasing her about her habitual clumsiness, Knox assigned her the task of taking care of Carl. Rona's initial surprise and reluctance faded, replaced by a begrudging acceptance. As Rona questioned the feasibility of having a horse in bed, Knox reminded her of Carl's condition and encouraged her to do her best. Reluctantly, Rona agreed, glancing at the horse with a mix of annoyance and sympathy. She then turned to Carl, asking if he was hungry, unknowingly embarking on an extraordinary journey. Knox, contemplating the unfolding events, realized that the shock of what was to come would test Rona's resilience. He wondered if she would be able to handle the weight of their shared secret. Three days had passed, and the day started with Rona's loud wailing. Rona was crying and holding Carl's head. She tells Knox that Carl was dead. Knox stares at them knowing that Rona was crying because Carl had left the world. He recalls the past memories of Rona taking extremely good care of Carl and had put in a lot of effort over the past three days. Knox felt bad for her but he had already knew that something like this would happen. And that Carl couldn't be saved, poor horsey guys. Knox then tells Rona to stop crying as it was distracting him, but Rona was still concerned about Carl. He tells her not to worry as Carl would soon return to his side again. Rona looked at him after hearing those words and wondered if something was wrong with his head. Feeling annoyed by her reply Knox tells her to get behind him now. He takes out a scroll from his jacket, and Rona was curious about the scroll. He unrolls the scroll and it showed a summoning circle on it as he places it down. Knox began to cast a spell thinking to infuse his mana into his scroll. Rona was shocked to witness what was happening as the spell was coming to completion. Knox showed a smile as a sweat drop appears on his face once the spell began to die down. Rona approached Knox with caution asking why he knew how to use mana as it was illegal, but Knox was too tired to reply and thought about how he couldn't control his mana well. He decides to go for another round. He tells Rona to stop distracting him as it will make Carl die a second time, and that this time it would be her fault. Rona covered her mouth to stop herself from distracting Knox, while he was trying his best to focus on the spell. He continues to cast the spell thinking that he needed to focus and that he was still someone that hasn't awakened their trait of genius of mana detection. Knox recalls the law about using mana under the age of 15 which was not allowed unless you were from the Imperial family, this made it possible for the descendants of the Imperial family to be several times more proficient at magic compared to other students who were learning to control mana later. Knox steadies his mind thinking that the only thing he could do right now was to pour as much mana as he could into the scroll. The scroll begins to emit purple flames which Knox could feel its energy from his palms. He realizes that this was mana. He smirks and thinks about how interesting it would be to use his one-time use skill confirmation vouches. Staring at his hand with purple's flames below it, Knox knew that he mustn't make any mistakes because of the magic that he will be using from now. A window appears saying that the skill book of the dead Necromicron which was a one-time use object had been obtained. Knox was using black magic now. A skeleton hand holding onto the book appears with a glowing purple aura. A window appears stating that the target Carl can be revived as an undead. The window asks Knox if he would like to use the magic. Within the game Inner Lunatic, there are two types of beings that possess the trait of an undead. The first type are beings that are brought back to life with black magic or dark mana. The second type were those that are brought back to life without an ego and are reborn as a stronger being. Quick question for the viewers which one would you choose? The first or second type, comment down below. Knox thinks that those types of beings would remain blindly loyal towards its master, almost to a fault. But the problem was that there was only one family that revives corpses as undead and that would be the Dark Family, Marva's family. While Rainhafer is also a Dark Family, it is mainly a Night Family, 
but the Marva's family is a family of black mages that control the undead. In that case, shouldn't players that don't belong to the Marva's family not be able to use their skills at all? Nox thinks. But because of the one-time voucher he had gotten a Necromicron, which was also known as the Book of the Dead causing Nox to smile. He then soon notices clawed hands appearing from the scroll of summoning. The hands began to surround the body of Carl and were reaching towards it. The hands soon began to cover the entire body of Carl into its darkness. Blood then dripped from Nox's mouth. Rona calls out to him but he tells her to be quiet, ignoring the blood that's on his face. He focuses on the spell for just a little bit more but it begins to wreak havoc all over. Nox begins to cough out blood. He looks at his hands and sees that his mana was running out and curses at it. But then he looks up and sees that Carl was now standing up from the dead. Carl roars out loud as its body had changed. Nox looks at Carl just as a window pops up informing him that he had activated the skill successfully. The window states that his pet Carl has been revived as an undead. The eyes of Carl shined bright like a diamond. And Nox was happy to see that the spell worked and that Carl was back from the dead. Rona calls out to Nox in concern so he stood up. Wiping the blood off his face, Nox calls out to Carl. Carl then approaches Nox and bows its head towards him. Windows appear everywhere showing Carl's traits and information, they were the same as before except he had gotten a negative trait, which states that Carl will be growing at 1.5 times the normal rate, and it would be possible for him to unsummon and summon Carl depending on the mana of the player, seeing these windows made Nox realize that he had succeeded. Nox touches the head of Carl and telling Carl that he will be his master from now on. Just as Nox was thinking, something interrupted him which Carl also notices. Rona had rushed in between the both of them and went to hug them. Catching the both of them off guard. Nox sees this and asks Rona what she was doing. But Rona was busy crying too much to hear his words. After calming down a bit she complained to Nox that he had used too much mana and that she thought something had happened to him. She also scolds Carl for being too reckless. But Carl ignores her words and faces away from her. This shocks and angers Rona as she yells at him telling him that she had cared for him so much. She tells Carl to spit out the carrot she gave him but Carl just snorts at her, Nox smiles seeing them having fun. He then thinks about what the next hidden piece would be up next. A few days later, Nox is seen walking around the estate at night and was inside the barn. He exits the barn and took out a shiny object and a piece of paper. Nox thinks to himself that the road wasn't much different when compared to the game. He places the paper back into his bag thinking that it was a relief. The second hidden piece of the Rainhafer family was an item that he must obtain. As it was a key that will help a little in compensating for the terminally ill trait. But then noises are heard from the bushes which Nox hears. Nox turns to see what it was. But thought that he was being too sensitive. A wooden sign is seen as Knox continued on his adventure. He thinks to himself that this was no longer a game but reality for him. The sign states that it was Mia's forest and that young children that enter may get lost and die. Just as Knox thinks about not wanting to die a second time. A window appears stating that Knox had entered the missing child forest, the name has changed from Mia's forest. Another window appears saying that failure to clear this palace will result in death. The missing child's forest was a forest that was within the Rienhafer's territory, where entry was prohibited, because of the darkness and fog, no matter how skilled a ranger or pathfinder is. They will still have trouble finding their way around. Knox thinks about the name of the forest, as it was a place that causes everyone to get lost like a child. But there was also a different meaning behind its name. If a full-grown adult were to kill a monster, they won't be able to get any artifacts. Nox shudders at the thought that he had died here a few times in order to find the right way to clear it as the difficulty of the monster would go up if they were an adult. Which was why the difficulty of the missing child forest was at least two and a half stars said Nox while thinking that this was a game where the difficulty is the worst. As he walks through the forest Nox thinks about how he had played this game really hard to clear it without knowing what items would appear, but now that he thinks about it, this was the perfect item for the terminally ill trait. He soon stops in his track to pull out a torch. He lits the torch up. 
the flames of the torch shined bright like a diamond in Knox's hand. Its light was paving a way forward for Knox. Knox lets the wind carry the torch smoke as the torch was a crucial key in clearing the missing child's forest, because of the direction of the smoke. But Knox smirks as the true key was to go in the opposite direction of the smoke. Before Knox moves on, he closes his eyes and grabs onto the sword. He turns around and speaks out loud saying how long do you intend to hide, how about revealing yourself now? But no one replies to him in the forest. Knox lets out a sigh saying hiding until the end ha? Huh? He grips his sword tightly and swings it towards a pile of bushes which lets out a scream. I can't believe that my beauty didn't work on him said a voice looking in the mirror. It belonged to Talia who couldn't understand it at all, but a voice calls out to her saying young miss. It belonged to her servant Emma who was begging her to stop following Knox around. She tells Talia that if she continues, she will be scolded. But Talia assures her that she won't allow her to be fired from the family, but Emma said that wasn't the point. As Emma walked through the hallways carrying a lit candle, she thought about how Talia was talented enough for people to respect her as the next matriarch, only if Chell wasn't around. Emma lets out a sigh as she wonders why Talia felt inferior to her own sister and was being so impatient. She soon reaches a door and thinks that Talia probably gave up on stalking Knox and was now sleeping. She enters the room and looks around. But fear took over her as she couldn't find Talia in the room. Her hand was trembling as she thinks about Talia going out to find Knox, she then wakes everyone up in the building. Talia was then revealed to be the one in the bushes with a dagger on her leg. Knox was stunned to see that it was Talia in the bushes. Talia then greets Knox, but he asks her what she was doing here. She hesitates to answer back at him, but then Knox notices something. He tells her to get behind him as he points the torch forward. A clawed paw and a tail was then seen. It belonged to a gray wolf. Talia began to grow nervous as she didn't expect to be in Grey Wolf's territory in the forest and that she only had a dagger with her right now. The Grey Wolf began to circle Knox and Talia. Its eyes were focused on them with evil. But then it raises its head up into the air and lets out a fierce owl into the air which startles Knox and Talia. As the light of the moon shined into the forest, the Grey Wolf lunges towards Knox and Talia with its fangs showing but Knox was smiling at this. While Talia was nervous, she was surprised to see Knox rushing forward. Knox uses the torch to land a hit on the gray wolf as it pounces towards them, and soon slices the neck of the gray wolf. It falls to the ground startling Talia. She thought about how incredible it was for Knox to defeat it so cleanly. But something catches her eye. Knox turns around to see her as his face was covered with blood. He then questions Talia about why she was following him as he had thought that it was his brothers that were following him. Talon twirls her hair and stutters saying she was out on a night walk. Knox goes to grab his torch saying not to bullshit him otherwise he would leave her here alone. Ah said Talia upon hearing those words. She grabs onto Knox's wrist which surprises him. She then explains in a mad flurry that she caught him sneaking out while thinking about how to be as strong as him and that if she followed him she could find out his secret training method, and that was why she followed him into the forest. Knox smiles and thinks about being certain about three things. The first thing was that Talia thinks immensely highly of Knox, the second was that she was not hostile towards him, and lastly that she was a kid that knows nothing about how dangerous it was to follow others late at night. Knowing that she was one of the core characters, Knox couldn't leave her here alone, he then tells her to follow him for now. As he begins to walk Knox tells her that he wanted to make something clear. Knox turns to her and tells her that he was not trying to help her, but was just trying to resolve the wolf situation so his family doesn't get put in a bad spot. Talia blushes and says she was sorry and that she was in the wrong this time. Knox looks at her and thinks that she probably won't do anything dangerous again. But then Talia begins to call out to Knox. And tells him thanks while blushing as the leaves flow around them. Knox was surprised to hear those words from her. Talia then begins to say something else, but was shocked to see something. A pack of gray wolves had appeared from the shadows. Talia calls out Knox's name as he stood there with his lit torch showing that they were up against a whole lot of gray wolves. 
Talia was trembling in fear as she holds onto Nox's arm tightly. But he tells her to get away from her which surprises Talia. Nox stands in front of her and tells her that she will be in his way when he swings his sword. He begins thinking about how there were some unexpected variables and that he needed to focus again. He stares at the Grey Wolves knowing that this was the place before the scenario starts, and that since it's an area within the prologue, there won't be any boss monsters. But an elite monster one rank below the boss monster will appear, the evolved form of the Grey Wolf he had just cut down called the Elite Grey Wolf. The Grey Wolves that were circling around Talia and Nox began to move and dash towards them, just as Nox thinks about knowing who his enemy is, doesn't mean that things would go smoothly for him. He slices the two gray wolves closest to him. As the wolves continue to attack him, a single wolf was standing behind its pack and watching the battle unfold as Nox thought to himself that there were times when one ought to realize that it's possible they've been driven into a corner. Nox notices something was headed to him. And he sees that a gray wolf had leaped towards him in the air. He continues to think that he'll repeat what he always said in times like this just like when he was Yuchan and player inner lunatic he prepares his blade for his next attack. And with a major swing of his blade it lands a hit onto the gray wolf, as he thought of himself as a F-I-N-G weakling. Nox finally relaxes and lets out a deep breathe. Talia who was holding onto the torch was amazed at Nox, and that he hasn't even revealed his full power yet, with his sword technique being even more amazing when he was fighting his brothers. She stares at the dead gray wolves and wondered if Nox had ever killed gray wolves before. Talia grips the torch tightly, thinking that Nox still thought of her as being weak. But something was happening in the forest that caught both of their attention. Nox looks up and noted that it was finally here. Elite gray wolves had appeared in front of them. Back at the barn on the estate, the servants were calling out to Talia and asking for more tortures. Two tracks of small footsteps are found marked on the ground where a servant deduces that they belong to the Nox and Talia's footprints. The servant told the others that he believed that the both of them had entered the missing child's forest. Emma collapses upon hearing that they went into the forest. She turns around to ask what they should do, telling the others that they needed to go into the forest immediately. But Rodwell tells her not to be foolish as going into the forest was impossible. Emma shouts at him wondering why they couldn't go in. It was because the forest was that something that even the Rainhafer family had managed to clear. The missing child's forest was ranked one of the highest within the Rainhafer family, while the Rainhafer family is known to be the strongest dark family in the South. The fact that there's still a forest that they aren't able to clear is basically like saying that they were incompetent. But there was the fact that only children who haven't become adults can enter the forest. And that the forest can only be cleared successfully by children hasn't made known to them yet. Rodwell thinks hard about why Knox would enter the forest. He looks at the footprints and didn't think that Knox was bewitched by a mind-controlling monster, and based on the tracks Knox had moved with care. There were also no traces of anyone getting past the strongest mana barrier of the estate too. Rodwell looks up into the sky and with all the facts that he had gathered, he realized that Knox had intentionally went into the forest. He grips his fist tightly, and knew that he could no longer see Knox as the weak and frail young master from before. Rodwell then begins to speak, telling the others that there was only one way for the both of them to return. He tells them that Knox has to use his wisdom to find their way out of the forest. Emma tears and sweat began to come out upon hearing Rodwell's words. The servants continued to search around the area with their lit torches. But Emma was still feeling terrified as tears flow from her face. She believes that she was the one who had caused Talia to die. Talia grabs the dagger off of her leg and prepares to fight back against the monsters. Nox looks back at her and tells her to not attack unnecessarily as she might get hurt so she just needs to stay out of the fight while thinking that she hasn't lost concentration despite being scared. He continues to advise her to save her strength and to run away if she were to be attacked, only then could she raise her rate of survival a little higher. Looking at the elite Grey Wolves Nox thinks that killing one wouldn't be that dangerous since it had only a two and a half rating. But all he wanted right now was for Talia to remain vigilant and to be able to react to her surroundings. Nox continues to look at her, noticing that she had learnt well, but not yet at a level where he could trust her with his back. He looks forward and started to prepare his attack. 
he activates the skill hour of the genius, thinking that by using this skill he could kill it in one go. But the elite gray wolf was smiling for some reason, which both Knox and Talia were surprised by. The pack of elite gray wolves seemed to be making fun of the two of them. Knox soon became annoyed as he realized what the gray wolves were doing. But all of a sudden, one of the gray wolves began to dash towards him. Knox easily lands a blow onto the gray wolf, causing the other gray wolves to stop in their tracks. But Knox was weary of why they stopped attacking together. The elite gray wolf was seen just laying on the floor with a calm expression on its face. The gray wolves then began another round of attacks by coming at Knox from all sides. Knox manages to slice one of the wolves with these once again. But another gray wolf appears behind him. It lets out a fierce roar that captures Knox's attention. Before Knox could react, a dagger was sent flying straight into the gray wolf's body, killing it. Knox looks to where the dagger had come from and sees Talia in the trees who tells him to be careful. Talia thinks about the fact that Knox had told her to run away once it got dangerous. But with a determined face, Talia didn't want to do that. Knox's feelings towards Talia began to change, as he wonders if she was going to help him. As Talia was up in the tree, she calls out to Knox asking if he was alright, her face was filled with concern about him as she continues to ask if he was hurt anywhere. Knox looks up at her thinking that she had helped save him just now. But something alerts him. He swings his blade to attack and defend himself from the attacks of two gray wolves. Knox began to breathe heavily after killing another gray wolf. He turns back to face Talia, telling her that he was alright while thinking that this wasn't the time to be so carefree. Talia continues to be concerned for Knox and tells him that she was glad he wasn't hurt. Knox prepares himself for another attack thinking that he had probably shown her a pathetic side. But something below him catches his attention. He looks at his hands which were trembling and realized that the recoil from his skill was already here. But more gray wolves slowly start to approach him as he knew that it wasn't over yet. The elite gray wolf was finally facing Knox with its eyes shining bright like a diamond. Knox smiles at that fact and thinks that it was finally getting up. The elite gray wolf begins to walk around Knox with its gaze still focused on him. It circled around Knox like a vulture while meeting his gaze. It lets out a low growl and speeds out from its spot towards Knox. Knox sees this and braces himself for a fight. But something else had happened. The elite gray wolf had dashed past Knox instead. Knox was confused AF about the actions of the elite gray wolf. He begins to think about the actions of the elite gray wolf and began to realize something. He hears rustling from behind him and turns, but was too slow. The elite gray wolf had sliced Knox's left arm with its claw. Blood was seen dripping from its claws after the attack. Talia sees this and calls out to Knox in concern. The elite gray wolf soon begins to run in a different direction. Knox could only stand still and held onto his injured shoulder. He curses at the thought that this was only supposed to be two and a half stars. He believed that the rating needs to be revised. As this elite gray wolf was smarter and more cunning than in the game, Knox steadies himself with his sword thinking that the attack just now took him by surprise. He looks around for the elite gray wolf thinking that he should have realized when it was controlling the other wolves earlier, and that it had used the terrain and geographical advantages too. A sudden noise appears from the bushes catching Knox's attention as he turns to face it. He stares in that direction and needed to first get his guard up. When the elite gray wolf was near him, Knox swung his sword towards it thinking that it had landed. But the elite gray wolf had stopped inches from Knox, causing him to miss his attack. Knox was surprised to see this, as the elite gray wolf snickers and smiles at Knox. It opens its mouth which revealed its sharp fangs and lunges toward Knox. Knox realized that it was waiting for him to do a huge swing and had shown an opening. Knox grunts hard and tries his best to swing his sword once again shouting out. But he soon realizes that the recoil had fully arrived. The elite gray wolf was now inches from his face with its mouth wide open ready to take a bite out of Knox. Knox sees this and wondered about how he couldn't predict this and if it was because he had gotten too excited due to having cleared the game many times before. 
his face was filled with dread as he thought that he could have done it all but that was a foolish judgment, he closes his eyes in preparation for the elite grey wolf's painful bite. But a rough sound was heard causing Knox to open to see what had happened. A dagger had been shoved into the elite grey wolf's eye. Knox thought if it is able to create an opening, we can also create one and the person who created that unexpected variable wasn't Knox, as it was revealed that Talia had thrown the dagger to save Knox's life once again. Holding onto his sword for dear life, Knox lets out a battle cry, pushing the sword straight into the elite grey wolf's body with all his remaining strength. It yells out in pain from the two attacks from Talia and Knox, and finally collapses onto the ground with the dagger still in its eye. Knox was breathing heavily and kneeled on the ground after being exhausted from the battle. Talia continues to call out to Knox but something catches her attention. She sees that there were still two grey wolves around looking at the scene. But they soon turn around and run away. Talia then leaps down from the tree. And rushes in front of Knox with the torch in her hand asking if he was alright. Knox wipes the blood off his face and started to thank Talia but stopped himself halfway. Talia was confused but Knox wondered why he was going to thank the enemy who was going to kill him in the future. Instead of thanking Talia, Knox told her that there was no need to worry. But upon seeing the clawed injury on Knox, tears began to flow in Talia's eyes as she yells at him about being injured just now and if he was really okay. Knox takes back the torch from her while telling her that it was just a slight wound, but Talia continues to ask but Knox cuts her off saying that it was fine. Hearing this made Talia glad as she tells him that she was glad he wasn't injured elsewhere. Just then a spider drops down from the heavens. Talia notices that something was crawling on her shoulder. She sees the spider as it was reflected in her eyes. Her scream was loud to the point that Knox was alerted to it, he turns to see what it was wondering if it was another monster. Talia rushes toward Knox with fear on her face and grabs him. Knox called out to her as she held onto him tightly. Talia mutters the word spider to Knox as she held onto him tightly with her teary eyes. But her eyes soon reflected the image of the spider that she soon spots on her shoulder. Seeing the spider caused Talia to grab onto Knox even harder as she screams out loud, Knox was stunned by her reaction as he wonders how long she was intending to hang onto him. He then looks at her with curious eyes, wondering if she was really afraid of the spider on her shoulder. Knox decides to wipe the spider off of Talia's shoulder with his hand, he then asks her why she was following him into the forest even though something like a spider was going to scare her. But Talia was still shocked by the presence of the spider as she continues to tell him about the spider and wondered if he too was also afraid of it. Knox teases her by saying that she definitely won't become a knight. Hearing that reply made Talia flustered as she shouts at Knox, but he was glad that she had finally let go of him. But Knox continues to cough blood due to the intense fight he had with the wolves. Talia asks him if he was okay with a concerned look on her face. As the coughing stopped, Knox informs her to not worry about him as he thought of the recoil. He then looks at her and thinks that she had finally pulled her own weight. Knox smiles at the thought that Talia had managed to save him, he wanted to thank her before but her screaming made it impossible, so Knox decides to just thank her in his head while Talia continued to look at him with concern. The sun finally rises and lights the forest up as Knox stares at it. A ring is seen near the corpse of the wolf that Knox had just killed with a dark aura emitting from it, Knox and Talia now need to get out of the forest. Crying noises could still be heard at the estate. Emma was seen still kneeling on the ground while crying, she says out loud that she was the one that had killed the young Miss Talia. Rodwell stood near Emma as he wondered if Talia and Knox did not make it. He looks up with a worried expression on his face as he thinks that the disappearance of Miss Talia will create a problem between both families and since a lot of children in this area would go missing in the missing child's forest. He continues to be worried as he thought of how the people who secretly say that the Rainhafer family was incompetent. But another servant shouts out to Rodwell, telling him to look over there. They could see that the fog of the forest was being lifted. The sight of the fog being cleared meant that the missing child's forest has been cleared. This sight stuns everyone at the estate as Emma and Rodwell stared at it in awe. Emma immediately stands up to ask Rodwell about the meaning behind the fog being lifted in the forest and if it meant what she thought. Rodwell agrees with Emma that her thoughts were right. 
he explains to her that the event of the fog being cleared meant that the missing child forest had been cleared, and that the only possibility that they were all thinking about had turned into reality. Emma became teary-eyed once Rodwell explained to her what was happening. Knox and Talia had now appeared at the entrance of the missing child's forest. The servants shouted out that young Master Knox was coming out. The servants were baffled to learn that young Master Knox had actually managed to clear the forest which was hard to believe and it looked like he was coming out of it as if it was nothing. Rodwell tries his best to hide his smile while knowing that he was certain now. With the clearing of the missing child forest, Rodwell knew that the hierarchy of the descendants within the Rainhafer family was about to experience great turmoil. Knox had finally returned and asked why everyone was gathered around the entrance of the missing child forest. Emma shouts out to young Miss Talia and rushes towards her. She immediately hugs Talia and tells her that everyone was extremely worried about her. Rodwell informs Knox that the people from the family were worried about his disappearance too. Knox was surprised to learn that his family was worried about him as he couldn't believe that they would worry over a good-for-nothing like him, the reputation of his family as a dark family was about to go down. Talia tells Emma to stop crying as she continued to wipe her tears away. Emma then grabs tightly onto Talia's shoulder. With a slightly angry voice, she tells Talia that she was going to tell her all about the 71 rules of the Stillrainer family again and asked Talia to follow her. Talia grew nervous and soon tells Emma that she was sorry. But Emma didn't let go of Talia, informing her that she wouldn't dare to blame her as she ensures Talia that the patriarch would be teaching her the rules personally. Knox looks at Emma and notes that she looked like Rona who has extraordinary stamina at level 4.5. Emma then thanks Knox for protecting their young miss while being in the forest. Still having a sad expression on her face, Knox tells Talia that even though he didn't have the intention of going in with her, she managed to pull her own weight, so she shouldn't beat herself up too much. Talia's face lit up like a Christmas tree upon hearing those words from Knox. Back at the family estate. Knox places down his sword and bag onto a chair. He starts to undress while being glad that his adventure in the missing child's forest was over. He touches his head with an exhausted look on his face, thinking about how Rodwell was waiting outside the forest with knights which was totally unexpected, he wonders if Rodwell did that because of Talia. But he brushes off that thought as a smile creeps on his face as he looks at his pocket, he had gotten the item that he wanted from the missing child's forest. He pulls out the hidden piece onto the palm of his hand, and a window appears telling Knox that he had obtained a new artifact, another window appears informing him that he has obtained an accessory called the Black Flame Ring. Window information about the Black Flame Ring pops up, its name was the Black Flame Ring, its category was accessory, its grade was low intermediate, its attribute was darkness, its stats were plus one stamina and plus one mana, and its requirement was that it could only be equipped by those who were able to use dark mana. The Black Flame Ring also had a special effect, when a user defeats a target while equipping it, the user will be able to steal a very small amount of their life force and turn it into theirs. The higher the rank of the target defeated, the more life force the player will steal. Knox smiles as he looks to the right, he knew that it was the only artifact that can steal someone else's life force. But his expression changes as he knew that just having the ring, doesn't guarantee that Knox will live a long life. Knox knew that one's life cannot be extended infinitely, and considering that only a small amount of life force can be stolen, it won't be easy to overcome the terminal illness, as long as Knox can struggle, he could progress. Knox decides to place the ring on his finger prompting a window to appear telling him that he has equipped the black flame ring. He smiles knowing that being able to struggle was way better than a life that was hopelessly on the verge of death. After equipping the Black Flame Ring, Knox could feel that his life force and mana were increasing. He soon shouts out calling Rona's name, he tells her that he knew that she had been lingering outside of the room for a while. The door to the room soon opens, Rona peeks her head out of the door, nervously asking Knox if he had the ability to see through things. Knox tells her that he might be able to which causes Rona to blush heavily as she covered her eyes with her hands, asking Knox if it also meant that he could see her naked body as well. Knox hits her on the head in anger upon hearing those words from her yelling at her about what she was talking about, Rona stumbles away from Knox after being hit and tells him that it hurts. As she rubbed the spot on her head that got hit, 
She asks Knox why his finger flick felt like it hurts even more now. Knox places his arm on the table telling Rona that they should arm wrestle which confuses her for a moment. Rona places her arm on the table as well with a confident look on her face as she tells Knox that if she wins, he will increase her salary. Knox agrees but warns her about losing as she knew that he would deduct 20% of her salary. They soon hold each other's hand and begin the countdown for the match. Knox looks in anticipation as the countdown reaches two. Upon hearing the number three being called out, he immediately slams Rona's arm onto the table with ease which surprises her. Rona's face was filled with dread and shock as she wonders what had just happened and that something was strange. She immediately calls out to Knox telling him that it was unbefitting of a reputable family's son to reduce the salary of a servant's poor pittance by 20%. Knox waves his hand in the air and tells her that what she said was true. But he reminds her that he was the rumored good for nothing of the Rainhafer family which was a rumor that she had spread. With a happy smile on his face. Knox tells her that he did not care for trivial things such as honor. Rona immediately bows on the floor to apologize to Knox. But a sudden feeling overcame Knox that jolts him up. Multiple windows appear informing him that the effects of the trait frequent sickness have been activated. Knox has obtained wrist fracture level 2 and obtained a level 1 flu. Knox was annoyed to be afflicted with such troublesome status afflictions. He then informs Rona that he would cancel the reduction of her salary if she brings him some ice and a wet towel. Rona looks at him with a worried expression as she could see that he wasn't looking too well. Knox had a painful expression on his face as he thought about being satisfied with getting the ring for now and that he needed to get some rest. But a memory started to appear from before his reincarnation. His past self was dying as he thought about how sure he was with the name, Yu Chan. The two hidden pieces, Carl and the black flame ring, it has been six months since Knox has gotten them, he closes his eyes, regretfully, however, there hasn't been a chance to use them, a sign is hung on the wall, where it states that our boy, Knox von Rainhafer has been grounded, Knox finally lets out a deep sigh over seeing the sign, he returns to his room, stating that it wasn't like he was planning on getting into any trouble, he had even cleared the missing child's forest. Knox still couldn't believe that his family had decided to ground him instead of rewarding him. He turns around to ask Rona if she agrees with what he said, but Rona couldn't agree with Knox since she was a maid that belongs to the family. Her worry was that her salary would be reduced if she spoke poorly of the patriarch. Knox tells her that he swears upon his hand that her salary will be reduced if she doesn't act to his preferences. Hearing those words shocks Rona. She immediately agrees with Knox that the patriarch was being way too harsh. She questions how he could not even understand how Knox would feel. Knox finally takes a sit, thinking about how hard he had been working on adapting to this life, and living a pretty productive life while watching Carl's growth, but he knew deep down that he couldn't carry on like this, because his life was being shortened even now. A new notification window appears, telling him that his remaining life he has left due to terminal illness is 147 days. Frustration took over him after reading that. His hand trembled as he knew that this darn system is more interested in his life than he was. Knox decides that he couldn't take it anymore. He needed to go to his father to seek permission to get out somehow. A few knocks are heard from the door as Rona tells Knox that she was just about to warm up the bathing waters. Rodwell greets Knox as young master. He bows his head and informs him that the patriarch has summoned for him. Knox was taken aback to see that what he wanted had been granted. A flashback is seen where many dead bodies lay on the ground covered in armor and swords, blood is spilled everywhere as a dark atmosphere was felt. The patriarch also known as Knox Daddy was seen standing alone on the battlefield with his sword covered in blood. He is surrounded by the dead bodies of demons, he glances upwards to the sky where a worried expression on his face. More demons with wings could be seen flying around the dark skies. This was the night of slaughter, red demons with wings appeared above him, screaming out horrifying sounds. They soon gather together and dove straight down towards Knox's father. He grips his blade hard as a dark aura is slowly being released from it. With a determined look in his eye, he lets out a powerful swing from his sword that slices through all the demons that came looking for him. Back to the present. The patriarch was thinking about the demons that were swarming back there, the humans that were caught up in them. In the night of slaughter, the room he was in was filled with a nasty black aura that spread all around him. He slowly opens his eyes. Thinking of that past memory as a disaster, the darkness that filled the room suddenly went inside of him, as if he was holding onto the powers of darkness, 
The patriarch knew that someday, one of his sons will probably learn the supreme black sword, but he couldn't rely on probabilities, he needed talent that is certain, because one of, them, will have to kill him, Rodwell soon appears in the room, he informs the patriarch that the young master Knox will be here soon, the patriarch noted that Knox was late, so Rodwell should send him in here right away, he recalls the missing child's forest as a place that even he was not able to clear, to think that Knox was able to clear that place, the patriarch thought that it would be appropriate to reward him, but the reason he was late in rewarding him, was because of the strong objections, of the family's vassals, the vassals didn't believe that Knox, who was a good-for-nothing, had changed, and began an investigation to check if Knox had really cleared the forest, the patriarch could be seen holding onto a document of the complete investigation, he looks at it, knowing that he couldn't ignore the opinions of their family's vassals, so the investigation was a necessary process. A hand soon appears on the room's door that catches his attention, Knox had finally arrived, he bows his head to pay his respects to the patriarch, the patriarch tells him to rise to which Knox agrees with, he informs Knox that he should have already known that his actions were wrong, Knox says yes, but the patriarch tells him that it was his job as the patriarch to give credit when credit is due, even if the credit belongs to a good for nothing, that was why the patriarch had summoned Knox, to discuss his reward. He tells Knox that he would grant him one request, the patriarch was willing to fulfill, just one request of his, no matter what it is, Knox was taken back by the sudden reward, he couldn't believe that the patriarch would be willing to give him anything he wanted, even to Knox, who had played tons of hours on Inner Lunatic, is seeing Theo giving a reward for the first time, Theo is the name of the patriarch, Knox thought about how he was usually authoritative and stern though, but Knox felt that someone had just shot him in the head, but again he felt that it was more like someone, just slashed him from behind, he looks at Theo and wonders if he would truly grant anything he wanted, anything, I'll grant you anything, as the patriarch of Rain Hafer, said Theo as he stood up, he continues to tell Knox that the promise to grant him anything, he swears it upon the long-standing history of the black sword, Knox didn't think that he was serious but guessed that that was who he is, but Theo reminds him that if the case of his request was too ridiculous, his evaluation of him will, change, so he trusts Knox to not do something that foolish. Knox agrees with Theo and asks to be given some time to think this over. Theo agrees with his request and permits Knox to leave the estate, but warned him that he was not allowed to get into trouble like he did previously. Yes, patriarch, Knox said with a smile after being granted back his freedom. Theo reminds Knox to always bear in mind that he is a part of the Rainhafer family. The next day, members of the family are seen gathered outside the mansion. Talia was wearing a beautiful green dress. She tells Knox that they would meet at Eldian Academy the next time they meet, but Knox was reluctantly to reply back to her, he simply turned his head away, Talia continues to pester Knox, saying she would see him again okay, but our shy boy still doesn't reply and turns his head again, Rodwell cuts in to inform Knox that he ought to answer when a lady asks him a question, Knox lets out a sigh before agreeing to Rodwell, he tells Talia, that they would meet if she becomes a full-fledged knight before that. Hearing those words suddenly gave Talia a body full of motivation, she wonders as in, as in not getting all scared even after seeing a super huge spider, said Knox, Talia became shy and blushes hard after hearing that comment, she sends a quick punch into Knox's stomach, causing him to spit out, he thought about how he should have said wolves instead of spiders would have been better, Talia continues to tell him that once she, returns after becoming a full-fledged knight, he should prepare his head for her, this sends shivers down Knox's spine as he wonders why she wanted his head, he thought about how she was intending to kill him, Emma cuts in to thank everyone for everything, especially to young master Knox, Knox wonders what a maid of the still in her family had to thank him for, Emma reminds Knox that she wanted to thank him for saving their young Miss Talia, Knox hears this and lets out a deep sigh, saying that it wasn't, like he was intentionally saving her, stop bothering me and leave already were the last words Knox told them as a carriage is seen leaving the estate, Knox continues to watch as they left, thinking that since one person had already left, it made him question why he was slowly getting used to this weird life, he didn't know the exact reason, but he felt that he was kind of enjoying it, a notification windows appears, reminding Knox that his remaining life he has left due to the terminal illnesses, 146 days, Knox was taken by surprise by this reminder, with 146 days left to live, he knew that he had no time to rest, a few days later, Emma tells him that he needed to get a new maid and new servants, Knox thought deeply about the new maid for a moment, but Rodwell soon enters the room and greets him, Knox asks him what was the matter, 
Rodwell informs Knox that the Eldian Academy has sent a maid in training to assist him. A young lady with green hair appears in a maid outfit. She bows her head to Knox, introducing herself as his exclusive maid from today onwards. Her name is Jitri de Lovilia. Knox took a moment before introducing himself. He scans her windows as it's reflected in his eyes. She was 15 years old, species human, main element Earth, but the most important thing in the window was the present situation. It was about monitoring player based on orders of Theo von Reinhafer. A new window appears with the update. It now states that Knox has 140 days to live. Knox was feeling anxious because he knew his time was limited. It feels like it goes to darn fast. The only positive thing here would be that he was actually growing pretty fast despite having such a severe penalty. Knox looks out the window. He knew that he will soon be admitted into the Eldian Academy too. Rona cheerfully reminds Knox that two months from now, he would finally start to attend the Eldian Academy. She questions him about whether he was feeling nervous. Knox questions her back on whether she was happy about the fact that he was leaving this place for the Academy. The sudden question startles Rona. She started to tear up and tells Knox that she was already starting to miss him. Knox felt something was off and tells her to not overreact since he was going to reduce her salary. Rona's face immediately turned normal. She salutes him and agrees to his command. Knox could only think that he didn't even have time to bully her now. Within the next two months, if Knox didn't increase his stats by even a little, he definitely won't be able to survive inside the academy. Eldian, the Empire's best academy is where monstrous strong cadets from all over the country gather. After surviving that place and entering the main story, Knox must play the role of the villain, Knox von Reinhafer as well. But Knox held a painful expression on his face. He knew that everything was so tough. The next part is a repeat. From before for some reason, Rona then informs Knox that he needed to get a new maid and new servants. Hearing this causes Knox to think about something, Rodwell enters the room and greets him. He informs Knox that the Eldian Academy has sent a maid in training to assist him. A young lady with green hair appears in a maid outfit. She bows her head to Knox, introducing herself as his exclusive maid from today onwards. Her name is Jitri de Lovilia. Knox took a moment before introducing himself. He scans her windows as it's reflected in his eyes. She was 15 years old, species human, main element Earth. But the most important thing in the window was the present situation. It was about monitoring player based on orders of Theo von Reinhafer. She looks at him and tells Knox that she would do her very best to support him. But Knox knew that they wouldn't let him leave this place comfortably. This brings us to Theo von Reinhafer, one of the biggest villains and one of the strongest beings in the world. When wondering about how he rose to his current position, many ask if it was from his swordsmanship alone. He's so skilled that few doubt that that's the case. However, the main reason that Theo was able to take his place as the top of the Reinhafer family was because he was suspicious of everything and everyone that was around him. Theo looks at Jitri telling her that he has great expectations for her this time around. She looks down and agrees to his request. Theo tells her that he had heard that she had been pushed back in the line of succession within the Lovilia family. He continues to say that if she does well this time, the Reinhafer family will spare no efforts to support her in the succession. Jitri agrees to assist young Master Knox with all her heart but Theo tells her no. She looks up at him, and could see a dark aura that covered him from head to toe. This sent shivers down her spine. She changes her instruction and pledges that she would monitor Knox strictly, and to report every single thing back to him. Jitri finally left the room and stood against the door, her heart pounding quick after meeting with Theo. His last words to her was to not forget who her master is. She unbuttons her collar to take out a golden item. She looks at it with concern in her eyes, knowing that from this point on, she mustn't waver any further. The lights in Knox's room continues to be shining. He lays back on his bed, thinking about the spy that was Jitri, he thought, about how Theo probably wanted to confirm whether the person within him was Knox or not, since demon possession is something that happens quite frequently within Inner Lunatic, and Knox is a character that had his body stolen by the number one demon, Ball, in the original storyline but Knox thought that it was fine as long as Theo doesn't find out who he really was. But a saddened expression still hung onto Knox's face. He thought of Jitri as the problem. Jitri de Lovilia, while she was not involved in the main storyline, it'd be a waste to throw her away like this. Originally, she was supposed to become the next head of the Lovilia family, but her father and mother were killed by her uncle, and she lost her position as the next head of the family. What happened next is obvious. In the end, she became a maid of the Reinhafer family and managed to escape from her family. 
she looks cheerful on the outside and is always smiling, but, the inside of her is so jaded and rotten, a character that is on the verge of breaking, and so her last decision would be that before the first part of the main story starts, she would commit the big no-no, if you need help guys, reach out, Knox continues to ponder about what he should do, he thought about creating a change to the storyline, by saving someone who ought to be dead, would that be the correct decision? Despite knowing that doing that would mean he would put a noose onto his own neck, the next day, Rona and Jitri stood side by side. Knox informs them that they would be hunting monsters within the forest and the territory, so of course the both of them would be following and helping him. Rona was alarmed to hear that while Jitri continued to stand still, Rona began to tremble with her words about hunting the monsters within the territory. She tells Knox that she was going to take a leave of absence because she was sick, but Jitri simply responded with, Understood, Rona grabs onto her hand, telling her that she couldn't just agree to everything. Knox thought about how it was normal for a maid to be sacred of hunting monsters. It was a ridiculous request after all. Knox could see that Rona's hands were still trembling and thought about Jitri's immediate response to his request. Knox gave off a smile before informing Rona that he knew that she had used up all of her leaves. Rona became alarmed after hearing that. Knox then tells her that she was not allowed to take a sick leave today. Rona became even more scared and wondered how he could do that to her, Knox reminds her that he was a good for nothing, and tells her that if she doesn't follow what he says, he would reduce her salary, so he wanted to go easy on her by reducing maybe half of her annual salary, tears stream down her face as she finally caves into his request, she cries and asks whether he wanted her to bring along a bow or a sword, Knox laughs at her response as Jitri calls out to him, she asks him if she could inform Rodwell that, he would be leaving the estate before she started to prepare. Knox thought about how she was right about that, but his top priority would be increasing his lifespan, since he was now free to go anywhere. The group could now be seen galloping through the forest on their horses. Theo watches them from his office window, a serious look was all he held. A few days later, the missing child's forest that looks like a normal forest after it was cleared, a wolf makes a sudden appearance, but our boy is prepared. He lets out a single slash that kills the wolf in one hit. A window appears to notify him that he has stolen a very small amount of the Grey Wolf's life force. He had also obtained two hours of life. Knox decides to take a look around while wondering if he had killed all the wolves in this area, since he gained two hours of life with a single hunt. This could be considered quite a successful hunt. Jitri appears with a bottle of water, informing Knox that it has been an hour since he started the hunt which made her wonder if he was tired. Hearing that news made Knox depressed, he knew that since he didn't activate the hour of the genius skill, it took a long time to hunt, that means he had only earned an hour, he knew the calculation wouldn't balance out nicely, but this is way too off, it's not like he can be killing monsters every single hour, the biggest concern however, would be that there are a limited number of monsters, since he had been hunting for the last few days, Knox has killed most of the monsters, at this rate, his plan of having a great life is in danger of completely falling apart. Knox lets out a deep sigh and stated that not having many monsters in this vicinity nowadays was also a big problem. Jitri couldn't believe that Knox had thinking that no monsters were a problem. She noted that if others were to hear what he just said, they would have thought of him as being strange. But Knox soon notices something. He turns to look at the sun and notice that it was already setting, since it couldn't be helped. He informs them that they should return to the mansion for today. Jitri then asks if she should prepare warm bath water for him as she would prepare it at a comfortable temperature. Knox thought that her actions were expected of a support genius. So he tells her that he wanted to bathe before dinner in order for her to make sure that the timing was correct. Jitri happily agrees to his request. Rona cuts in and tells Knox to not forget about her as she was sure to clean his room. Knox was confused but eventually tells her to do whatever she wants. Rona immediately gathers all of their stuff while Jitri laughs over her reaction. Knox then calls Jitri to the side by herself. He looks down but informs her that he had a question for her. Jitri started to grab onto the towel tightly. He looks at her and then asks about who she served. This question causes her to be stunned. Knox recalled her traits where one of them was the support genius, but he knew that no matter how beautiful or great a sword is, if he couldn't use it, then he won't hesitate to throw it away. Jitri continued to remain silent and her gaze was faced away from Knox after hearing his question. Knox understood what her reaction meant and told her that that was her answer. Jitri was scared as she told Knox that she hadn't said anything yet though, but Knox knew about what she wanted to say. He tells her not to worry as he wouldn't intend to interrogate her any further. Knox was instead thankful towards her as Jitri didn't lie to him. 
he then tells her that no matter who she serve, he'll think of her as one of his own. A curtain of fear soon fell upon her after hearing those words from Knox. He walks past her while continuing to say that if she needed to, then she could make use of him as well, which was all he wanted to say. Jitri simply stared at his back as he walked off, while Knox thought that as compared to having mutual trust, wouldn't it be sufficient for them to just be making use of each other, because that was the kind of relationship they had with one another after all. The scene changes to the home of Knox. Rona is laying in bed asking Jitri if she felt that Knox was just being too much. Rona thought about how Knox would say certain things like, If you don't run together with me, what fun would it be for me to train? She curses him over the fact that he did it to her every time they trained. She then asks Jitri if she thinks that he was too much as well. Jitri looks at her and agrees with what she said with a smile on her face. As she gazes out the window, she felt that the rumors that Knox was a changed person was real, as she had heard them countless times from when she was in the Lovilia family, but she had initially thought that the rumors were probably fabricated, since it's really rare for someone to change this much, but she recalled that the rumors had said that he had defeated the twins in one go and obtained the right to attend the academy, and he's also someone who's solidifying his standing within the family, which was totally different from Jitri, who's fallen all the way down despite being a legitimate successor but what pains her the most was what Knox said to her today. She recalls the moment when he told her to make use of him as well. She continued to think deeply about what he meant by that as the night went on. Shortly after, a groundless rumor started to spread around within the Rainhafer family. The rumor stated that Jitri was expelled from her family, and now no longer deserved to be a mate of the Rainhafer family. A letter was written with the words, Jitri de Lovilia, listen up, you, the incompetent family head who sold out your family will be held accountable for your sins. You have been stripped of any rights that you have as a direct line descendant. After reading the letter, Jitri knew that she won't be able to stay within the Rainhafer family for long as well, which was to be expected as the Rainhafer family was one of the top dark families after all, even though she was just being used as a maid for a good-for-nothing son. She was now a commoner who had lost her family and lost the right to serve Knox. She also knew that soon she'll be cut off and will be serving someone new soon, but she decides to show a bright smile as she entered the room while greeting everyone hello. Seeing their reaction to her presence made Jitri realize that they had probably heard about the rumors. She looked down with a sad expression as she was already used to these looks of disdain, but a familiar voice calls out to her. Rona appears by her side and tells her that she had been looking everywhere for her. Jitri couldn't believe this and wondered if Rona didn't know about the rumors, but she still held onto her hand. Seeing this action made Jitri think if Rona was just messing with her or that she really thought of her as a friend, but whatever it was, Jitri was sure that Rona was doing something foolish right now. She continued to think that Rona, her and Knox were all just foolish things. Knox was seen sitting in his room thinking that the end is imminent, not just for Jitri, Theo probably received the letter as well. All the crimes that were framed upon Jitri's father, Knox knew that they were all fabricated, but he also knew that he was unable to help her because there was no way to know what butterfly effect would be caused just by him helping her survive. The next day, wolves continued to be slain. Knox had resumed his hunt of wolves in order to sustain his own life force, but he held a cold look in his eyes. Rona talked about how Knox looks a little harsh today. She talked to Jitri about how he used to be a little more merciful in the past, but she noticed that he seemed a little off today. Jitri looks at her and wondered what she meant by that. She then thought about how Knox's current state was making her feel uneasy, with his sword covered in blood. Knox swings it down to get rid of it, looking around while thinking that it should be about time it appears. He wonders if it was not going to come out today as well, in the missing child's forest, a monster that appears randomly when there's only about 20% of the monsters left, the hidden boss monster. Knox was thinking of killing it because he thought it would help him in getting his stats increased, but he guessed that it was not going to work but a rustling noise from the bushes catches his attention. Something extremely quick like the flash went past his face as he wonders what it was. The speedster smacks Knox, but he manages to block it while noting that its speed was on a totally different level. But this brings a smile to his face as he guessed that this was what a hidden boss was like. The speedster was revealed to be the elite king wasp. Knox was annoyed because this was a troublesome one, but it was not at a level that he couldn't kill. But Jitri calls out to him in a hurry as Knox turns to see her. Jitri stood in front of the elite king wasp's attack, shielding Knox from its horror but all Knox could think of was that even without Jitri's help, that was an attack he could either dodge or block, he wondered why she had saved him, he continued to wonder about how many people would be able to run towards a monster that suddenly appeared, 
Knox made sure to make use of this as well for the sake of saving her, but his face wore a different feeling as he grinds his teeth in anger. He then activates his skill The Hour of the Genius. A flashback is seen where a young Jitri is crying over her injured knee. A voice calls out to her and wonders why their dear Jitri was always falling down. Another voice agrees and notes that there has never been a day that her wounds on her knee are completely healed. That's what her parents always told her, that her wounds were never completely healed. But Jitri knew that it doesn't simply apply to only her knee wounds, but also her heart wounds. She wonders if they were prophesying over her previously. She then recalls the question of who do you serve from Knox the day before. Jitri continued to think deeply about who she serves. A memory of her father came into her mind, along with the memories of her uncle killing her father and telling her that the family was now his. Her mind then went on to Knox's father while thinking about who she serves. The question that Knox asks her repeated in her head along with his other words. We return to the present where Knox and Rona are calling out to Jitri. Two windows appear to tell Knox that he had defeated the monster and will be given special rewards. Knox looks at her with a worried expression on his face as he tells Jitri to hang in there for a while. He continues to tell her that it was all over now and that he'll take her back. Rona reminds him that they needed to head back to the mansion quickly. Lies. Is what Jitri thought as she looked at Knox. She wonders if that was the expression of someone who's just trying to make use of her would look like. Jitri tried to open her mouth to speak but couldn't making her wonder why. Why does she feel a slight tremble as her vision of Knox started to blue, as well as anger in his voice? Tears flow down her eyes as she closes them. Theo reads a letter in his hand and spoke out that it is indeed troubling. Rodwell informs Theo that based on their investigation, the contents of the letter are true. The Lovilia family has decided to completely cut off Miss Jitri. Theo thought about the reason he brought Jitri here in the first. It was for the sake of taking over the Lovilia family, since they have lost their previous head of the house and are in an unstable state. He thought that this would be the perfect chance to take over them, for example, if the situation within the family is so unstable that the successor's position in the family would be shaky, with the involvement of Rain Hafer, they should be able to bring them into submission somehow, but what if Jitri is expelled from the family, before any plans can even take place? Theo talks about how it couldn't be helped and asked Rodwell about what he thinks they should do with Jitri, Rodwell replies that while it's regretful, if they place a maid that doesn't belong to any family beside Knox, they'll be looked down upon within Eldian Academy. Rodwell then tells Theo that they ought to deal with this quietly on their end. Theo replies that he had similar thoughts as well. Sir, shouted someone as the door to the room is open. Rodwell turns around to ask why he was barging in without permission making the servant apologize. He then informs Theo that Knox was seen carrying back a maid who had been injured during his hunt. He continues to say that the maid has been poisoned and was in a very critical state. Knox had also used a very expensive antidote without permission which was why the servant was here to report that to Theo. Rodwell questioned the servant on whether Knox had used the Mandrix purifying potion. The servant nervously says yes. Rodwell shakes his head in disbelief as it was a really expensive potion while Theo thought that Knox had grown attached to the maid so quickly, and he knew that no one knows what result could come out of personal feelings like that. A blurry vision of Rona is seen as she calls out to Jitri asking her if she was awake. Rona cried tears of joy as Jitri opens her eyes. She wondered what had happened and if Knox was safe. She recalled the memory of throwing herself to block the wasp attack, making her question herself on why she did that. Rona explains to her that Knox had used an antidote on her. She tried to say its name but couldn't remember it. She continues to explain that he used the antidote that was supposed to be really good. He had totally ignored the doctor's refusal to use it and asked him to use it on you unless you wanted to die. Rona was glad to see that the good-for-nothing side of him was still around. Hearing the word Mandrick made Jitri wonder why he would do that for her. Her hand trembles as she thought that Knox simply wanted to make use of her. As Jertri got up Rona tells her that she needed to get some more rest, but Jitri wanted to know where Knox was. Rona thought about it and remembered that he had went to look for the Chamberlain and that he asked her to update him once Jitri was awake. Rona then leaves the room to update Knox, but before she left she tells Jitri to make sure to get plenty of rest. Jitri didn't get any rest but instead went to grab her suitcase. She began to pack her stuff knowing that she shouldn't be here, but the truth was that she knew that she didn't deserve to be anywhere. With a saddened expression on her face, Jitri took out her necklace and removed her precious photo of her parents, placing it alongside a letter where she tells Knox that she knew about how he used a potion for her, and that she thinks that the pendant would be able to pay for the cost of that with some excess money. She then thanks Knox for saving her life, with sad look on her face. Jitri had prepared herself with her belongings to leave, 
but as she began to leave a voice calls out to her, asking her where she thought she was going right now, Knox appears in front of her, with a serious look on his face, he repeats his question, where are you going? Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.